Hello. On behalf of the Muslim Students Association of Iowa State University, I would like to, I would like to welcome you to our lecture, Religion and Science, by Dr. Ahmed Sucker. Before we begin our lecture tonight, we will have a short Quranic recitation by Mr. Hisham Ahmed. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. Translation In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful, all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the most gracious, most merciful, owner of the day of judgment. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who earn your anger, nor of those who go astray. Thank you. Before I bring on, before I bring on our speaker, I would just like to tell you a little about our speaker. Dr. Ahmed Sucker is the president of the Islamic Foundation of Knowledge. He is the author of several publications, well over 20 publications. Some of his books include books of Al Khutbah, which is the books of the Friday prayers, the lectures that we would give then, the orations of the pulpit, um, chronicles of Khutbah. He also has many books on health foods and nutrition. Some of these books include Dietary Regulations and Food Habits of Muslims, Overeating and Behavior, Fasting in Islam, Food and Overpopulation, and, uh, and a Handbook to Muslim Foods. In addition to this, he has also authored several books on Islamic, fun Islamic Fundamentalism and also, on, and also Introducing Islam to Non-Muslims. Dr. Ahmed Sucker was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and he received, his, he received his academic education in the American University of Beirut, and also at the University of Illinois, where he got his PhD. I would like to now bring on our, our guest lecturer for this evening, Dr. Ahmed Sucker. And also, before he comes on, I would like to ask if you could please, pull, could, you could please come forward so this way you can appreciate the lecture more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I greet you with the greeting of Islam, and the greeting of Islam is Assalamu Alaikum. May the peace, the blessing of, and mercy of Almighty God be upon you all together. We are grateful to Almighty God to allow us to come this evening here to share with each other some reflections about science and religion. I'm grateful to the leadership of the Muslim Student Association who invited me here. This is not the first time I come to this campus. I came here a few years ago to talk on different subjects. And special thanks to Hisham, who made the arrangement for me to come here. And I'm very grateful to the moderator uh, who introduced me. Uh, we are grateful to the university officials who make such type of arrangement for speakers to come from different parts of the world to come and share with us. 
I just came from California and I was touring to different states day after day. From Friday up to now I'm touring to Portland, Oregon, Dallas, Texas and uh, four different cities around Dallas, Texas and I am after here I have to go to New York to continue my touring in this uh, loving country. Uh, my dear friends here, since uh, a good number of you are Muslims and non-Muslims together, usually it is difficult for any speaker to speak on any particular sub subject which has something uh, related to religion or related to Islam when the Muslims are inviting non-Muslims. And this uh, gives me the story of a wise man in the Middle East who is known as Juha or Haja Nas Nasruddin in Persia and Turkey. And that wise man was asked to come and give a lecture. After he looked at the audience, he got confused what to say. After he greeted them, he told them, do you know what I'm going to talk to you this evening? In a very polite way, they said no. He said, thanks God. Why should you come to, learn, to, to listen to a talk that we don't know the subject about? He tried to sneak out. He said, we brought you a long distance to come here and talk to us. So he stood again to talk again. He looked at them and greeted them and he said, now do you know what I'm going to speak about? In a very nice way, very polite way, smiling face, said yes. Say thanks God, since you know what I'm going to speak about, why should I speak on a subject that you know about? <laughs> he tried to run away, they brought him again. And after that he looked at the same thing and he repeated the same question. He said, now do you know what I'm going to speak about? This section said yes, this section said no. He said, would you kindly, those who said yes, tell those who said no what I'm going to speak about. <laughs> now, for those of you who are Muslims, and you know exactly what I'm going to speak about, so take it easy on the audience. You may know mo much more than me, and therefore I'm not <laughs> here to speak to the Muslims mainly, I'm here to speak to the non-Muslims mainly. And the Muslims have to share with me and since the time is short, I'm not here to live with you, to share all the subject. It's a huge subject, that it is a course by itself. And even each chapter is an hour by itself, so I have to zoom fast. And then those who know the subject after I leave, help me to tell those whom they were confused because I was running very fast, what did I mean? And this will improve our relationship as a human being to live peacefully together in this part of the world. My dear friends, uh, I'm not here to compare science with religion. I'm not here even to approve or to condemn one or the other. Uh, you know, science is science. Everybody knows what is science. Science is uh, you are supposed to, you, we are supposed to use our brain by observing the whole universe. And this is what happened to Prophet Abraham. He tried to observe the whole universe and investigate. He had the inquisi inquisitiveness in himself to look and see what is around him. Science demands from you and me to go and have commitment. I want to do something. What is it? Do research with an objective to find results. Through the research, uh, research you find certain observation and symptoms in, different, in specific areas and you collect data and then you come up with some type of an idea and then you reflect on these ideas. Finally, you deduce a hypothesis and you make a theory and you declare your results to the public. Now, these results could be true, temporary, could be not true after a year or 10 years. Other scientists will negate what you have found. Whatever you find today may be not true tomorrow. And this is part of life in science that we are living in a life of scientific investigation, which means that the science that we say today, uh, or 50 years ago, 100 years ago, is not an absolute thing. It's some are absolute, others are not absolute. Depends which observation, which deduction, which we came to find out. And who is that uh, scientist who came with such type of a conclusion? Now, religion, there are two ways of looking at religion either a man-made religion or a revealed religion. 
man-made religion can be changed any time. You may claim uh, you are an author of a religion and it is your own investigation, your own deduction, your own hypothesis, and you claim to the audience that it is a revealed religion while it is your own personal religion that you brought to mankind. A revealed religion is totally different. A revealed divine religion from God directly to a particular prophet is absolute. And which religion we are talking about? We did not specify. The MSA here did not specify. They say religion. So could it be Christianity, Judaism? You want Hinduism, you want Baha'ism, you want Confucianism, you want whatever you want. Which religion you are talking about? So this means that we have to stay here one whole semester to speak on science and religion. Or we take a particular specific religion that the student, the Muslim student, have requested because they are Muslims, therefore they want to reflect what Islam says with sciences. If I am true what you want me to say, which means that the title is Islam and Sciences. What Islam says about sciences, uh, the religion of Islam. Usually in general, when we talk about religion, we are talking about spirituality. Your spirituality means your relationship with God. That is religion mainly, inside a church, inside a temple, a synagogue, or where, whatever it might be. But, and sometimes the religion may or may not have anything to do with science. It may have, it may not have. If and when there are some scientific deductions that may look contrary to, re to religion, those who are fervent to their religion, they say science is wrong, religion is right. Those who are in between, in between. And others, they say, forget about religion, we go through sciences. That's a human life. We are seeing it every day. So my talk tonight is not science and religion comparing, contrasting, condemning, and approving, in as much as scientific reflections. And let me use the word reflections. Scientific reflections. Whatever I have read from childhood up till now, whatever I have done in my biochemical, microbial, and biological sciences, uh, reading and research, and comparing, contrasting to reflect with you. So it is a matter of reflection, scientific reflections, that has been deduced directly from a book called the Quran, or you may call it Islam and Sciences. Now, Islam is not a religion in the Western sense. So let me clear it up from the very beginning. Islam is not a religion in the Western sense. The Western sense is a religion, as I said, between you and God, and that's it. It may have between you and your friend as an individual, as a society, but Islam is a complete way of life and a total way of life. It is a total systems of life with spirituality as well as with government. So state and religion are combined in one system. They cannot be separated, including politics, education, economics, sciences, social studies, cultural activities, family, inheritance, marriage, divorce, and so on and so forth. And as I said, I'm not here to blame any religion rather than enhance the idea of how we can live peacefully together as Muslims and non-Muslims. The early Muslims pioneered themselves in science and technology. They pioneered themselves in medicine, arts, chemistry, physics, geography, astronomy, language, and navigation. And there are many books that have been written about this subject and specifically what I have said in detail what they have done, the early Muslims. Some uh, authors, they call the Arabs civilization. It isn't the Arab civilization, it was the Muslim civilization. Yes, the Arabs were pioneering with them, but it wasn't Arabs, Arabs, because they have mixed the Arab with Islam. An Arab may not be a Muslim, and a Muslim may not, may not be an Arab. An Arab could be a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, an atheist, or whatever you may call them. A Muslim could be an Arab or could be Pakistanis, Indian, Indonesians, Malaysians, uh, American, African, European. 
So there are 20% of the Muslim population who are Arab or Arabic speaking people and 80% are non-Arabic speaking. And the total population of the Muslims in the world is an average of 1.2 billion. In North America, 6 to 8 million. And among the Arabs themselves in the Arab land, in the 23 Arab sovereign states, about 10% Arabs who are non-Muslims. So at, at least I thought I'll make it clear from the beginning so we don't feel uh, sensitive. Now, when Muslims uh, pioneer science and technology, it was the religious fervousness and the religious commitment and the religious observation. Uh, they want to observe their religion and therefore they have pioneered some of those scientific research and investigation while Europe was in its decadence. The first as, uh, observatory was invented by the Muslims during the days of the Abbasid dynasty and in the days of Harun Rashid. The first clock was invented by the Muslims and the first clock was given to the European King Charlemagne by also Harun al-Rashid, the Abbasid Khalifa. It was mentioned in a book uh, in Oxford University in England, the title of which is 10,000 words in English that we are speaking now are Arabic words. Now many of you will tell me where are those 10,000 words in English language, in the English dictionary, Webster dictionary, they are Arabic words. I can invite you to that textbook that has been written by a linguistic professor in England who had proved the root of those words and those words are Arabic words. Now, when I was in Madrid, Spain, and I met one of the diplomats there, I said, I have heard that in Spanish language there are 30,000 words are Arabic. He said, no. I said, what? He said, there are 100,000 words in Spanish language that are Arabic. Now, California, the name of California, I came from California, and many Californians don't know that even California is an Arabic word. I said, is it true? If you want, ask Dr. T.B. Irving, a professor of linguistics, uh, very close to you here in Cedar Rapids. He can tell you the root of California and what he has written about the root of the word of California came from Caliph and Onya, the house of the Caliph. The Spaniards who came from Spain and migrated to Latin America and took over the land of United States, Western United States, which is California, they have in Santa Barbara a house of the caliph, what does this mean? They have brought with them the culture with them from Spain whereby any government official lives in a house of the government. That house is the house of the government. Like you say, the White House in Washington, D.C. The governor here in Iowa should also live in a mansion belong to the government, should be called the small White House. Every governor, every mayor, every senator, every congress should live in a house which belongs to the government. Therefore, it should be called the little white house rather than the big white house. The Spaniards have had that culture that any, gov any governor lives in the house of the government is the government's house, the caliph house. So the house of the caliph in California ended up into California. Now, we have several towns in California. One of them is Alameda. One of them, Alhamra. And one of them is Cordova and Granada. Of course, all these are Muslim towns in Spain. Alameda, those Arabs who speak Arabic can help me. Alameed and Alameda. Alameed has two complementary meanings. The dean of the college of is called Alameed. The dean of the college of female dean is Alameda. So the early Muslim ladies and men have reached in their scientific investigation and academic education to be the dean of the college of. Could be college of medicine, college of engineering, college of law, and so on and so forth. So men and women reach the level of becoming the dean of the college, which means education for men and women was long in the history of Islam pioneered by both genders rather than one over the other. The second complementary meaning for those who know also Arabic, help me, 
those who know in the military, the chief of the staff of the army is called Al-Amid. Al-Amida is the chief of the army lady. Now the Arabs are laughing. <laughs> it's good to laugh. To see the influence of the early history of Muslims, how they have it. Of course, Al-Hamra is the palace in Spain, which is uh, being converted, used to be a masjid, also it has been converted into a church and a museum. Now, Europeans had to go to the Muslim countries to educate themselves in science and technology. It's well known during the decadence of Europe. And unfortunately or fortunately, in most of your textbooks, in any textbook of science and technology, the first chapter of introduction of that particular subject, they talk about the historical things of that subject. And we know nothing of civilization of the whole history of mankind except European Renaissance. What was before Renaissance? Nobody knows, nobody cares. Why they don't care? Because there was nothing as if Adam and Eve landed in the days of Renaissance of Europe. There was no Chinese history, no Indian history, no Greek history, no philosopher, anything. If there is any philosopher, it's only the European philosophers. Anything outside Europe, out of the planet. But we do know that the Renaissance of Europe came because they were in decadence. Why they call it Renaissance? Because there was decadence. From where they get their Renaissance, they, get, they got the Renaissance because they went to the Muslim world and study science and technology. And the Muslim world was in its zenith while the European was in decadence. They went to Cairo. They went to Damascus, to Baghdad that we have bombed. They have, went, uh, they have gone to Cordoba. We are bombing the, uh, the cities of civilization. We, the Americans, we are bombing all the cities of uh, civilization when the Europeans were there to learn science and technology. They went to Cordoba, Granada, Seville, Toledo, not Toledo of Ohio, Toledo of uh, Spain. They went to Alhambra and they went to Timbuktu. What? Timbuktu? Is there a city or country called Timbuktu? Many times we say Timbuktu in America. We don't know. Go and see the people of Timbuktu, beautiful people, the best people you can see with peace. I met uh, those people in uh, Senegal, and really, they are outstanding, but they are out of civilization. Timbuktu used to be a city of civilization, science, technology. Europeans used to go there to get, like, academic education. Colonialism of Europe went to Africa exploited all those countries, now you go to Timbuktu. It's a small town with huts, mud houses, no streets, no electricity, no water, no bathtub, no anything, no toilet inside the houses, but they live peacefully, no vandalization, no stealing, no killing, no raping, nothing, they live peacefully there. But because it becomes out of civilization, in the modern terminology. So anytime in, in America we say, you go to California or go to Timbuktu, who cares? Hmm? Timbuktu, because it doesn't exist. It exists, the people are there, beautiful. Now the early Muslims uh, invented the numerals, one, two, three, that we use them now. Europeans were using the Roman numerals. And I challenge all of us, if we can now use the Roman numerals and if I give you a number, multiply by a number, give me the figures immediately with Roman numerals. Whether you are using your calculators, or you are using your computer, or you are using your computer brain, it is not as easy as one, two, three, that we are using this one, two, three, four, five. These are so-called the Arab invention or the Muslim invention. How about if I tell you, is there anything which is called nothing? You tell me vacuum is nothing. The early people, when they were asking about nothing, they said, there is nothing called nothing. The early Muslims said, yes, there is something which is called nothing that you can work with, play with, and then use it. It's not the vacuum. They said the zero. European philosophers, Chinese, as well as Indian and Greek, never thought of something called nothing that you can work with. So the early Muslims have invented even the word zero, and we are using it up till now. The
people in Spain at that time, Andalus, as well as in Baghdad, in Cairo, in Damascus, and other I challenge any American university will do what the early caliphs have done to the professors. One professor was in Spain, was given a token of appreciation to do his scientific research. The caliph gave him 40,000 gold dinar as a token of appreciation other than his salary, other than the cost of the research. 40,000 gold dinar, if you multiply them, each gold dinar, one ounce today, is a minimum of $385. It will end up into 12 to $13 million of today without the inflation, without the appreciation, without anything. Who is that American professor, European professor, or anywhere in the world will be given such type of a gift from the president to tell him go and do scientific research because we do encourage every research to be done for the sake of mankind. When the king of England sent uh, send his son to Spain to study medicine, as usual, son of a, game, a king is a king. When he comes uh, to the class, why should I study, why should I attend? So he took it for granted, I'm the son of the king, why should I attend daily or regularly? And you know here, whoever makes uh, three cuts and above, the professor will tell him you are out of the class. That young boy didn't study much and he was spoiled. He failed, he, wants, he came to study in Spain to become a physician, a medical doctor. When he failed the first time, second time, third time, the professor sent him back with a letter to his father, the king. Your majesty, the king, your son does not deserve to be the future physician of mankind. Better put him on your farm. He is better to be a shepherd to your animals rather than to take care of, any, uh, of a human being. Which means that they, don't, they did not care whether you are son of a king or you are a peasant or whatever. All of us are equal and everybody has to study. And you'll never be given a certificate of graduation unless with blood and sweat, even if you are whoever you are. Now, the first academic institutions in the history of mankind that we look like now, academic institution, we are proud of it, no doubt about it. Where were those academic universities where students used to migrate from city to city, town to town, country to country to come and study? History report for us, three major universities, each and every one is more than 1,000 years old. About 1,200, 1,100, 1,300 years have been established as academic institutions without having the facilities of today, but they have established academic institutions. One of them is the University of Al-Azhar in Cairo, University of Kairawan in Tunisia, and the University of Karawiyun in Fez, Morocco. Now, later, those that I am talking about Muslims, Muslims went into their decadence. When Europe went into up Renaissance, Muslims somehow, somewhere went down the hill. Why? I don't know. You can ask your friends here, the Muslim boys and girls, if I may use, or the men and women here, Muslim men and women, ask them, you yourself Muslims here in America, what are you doing? Maybe they have done the same thing. When the Muslims of the Middle East migrated to Europe and they saw the beauty of, shall I use the word, I mean dancing, drinking, and other things, they got involved in, and therefore they forgot their obligation to their mankind and to their God. So they lost their leadership and they lost the concept even of the democratic Shura, I'm using the Arabic word shura, which is uh, consultation means equally. We don't dictate on each other destiny. But unfortunately, we ended up with dictatorship and monarchy, totalitarian system in different parts of the Muslim world. And that has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do that a person has to dictate the, di the destiny of the whole community. And therefore, my dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't compare now, the nowadays, 
Muslims in the Muslim world with Islam, and don't feel bad those who are Muslims, Islam is Islam, Muslims are Muslims. Like, don't compare Christianity with Christians. Don't compare Judaism with the state of Israel. Don't compare uh, Protestant uh, and Catholics with the Dutch people in South Africa, and so on and so on. It's good, very young. Don't compare America and say America is the White House and foreign policy, no. America is America. And don't tell me America is only the homeless people in downtown LA or Detroit, or the drug addicted, or the drug pushers, or the shooting. In LA, shooting and killing. That, that's part of America, but it's not the whole America. America has its beauty. America it has down the hill. Everybody knows it. If you go to the hillbillies and you tell me the whole Americans are hillbillies, it's not true. It's part of it. Don't go to Indiana and tell me the whole America is the Amish. Yeah, there is Amish. There are a large population or a small population of Amish people, but the whole America is not Amish. So we cannot pick up one item here and there and then accuse the whole population, like what we are seeing today. In the whole mass media for the last few months, Muslims are being accused as terrorists, fundamentalists, hijackers, and so on and so forth. And maybe some of you, when the moderator introduced me that I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, yes. So am I a hijacker, a terrorist? If yes, huh, I'll take off my jacket and you see there is no gun under mine. Huh. I mean, you may be afraid and I give the benefit of the doubt for many non-Muslims to be scared of Muslims because what the mass media is saying about Muslim terrorists, terrorists, terrorists. How about that Mr. David Koresh in Waco, Texas, who claimed himself to be Jesus Christ? We never accuse Christianity and Christians and Catholics because of what he has done. We are not accusing every Jew and every, the Jews are bad because the state of Israel has deported 417 professors, medical doctors, engineers, lawyers, dumb them under the snow. We do not accuse the Greek Orthodox who happen to be the Serbs who are killing genocide, mass, mass genocide on the Bosnian who happen to be Muslims. We do not say the Greek are bad or the Greek Orthodox are bad. We do not accuse the Catholics because the Croat, Croatians in Croatia, have also collaborated in killing Muslims. We do not accuse the Pope what the, Cro what the Catholics are doing. So there is no overburden of one over the other. If somebody did, it's his mistake, not the mistake of the rest of the people, neither the mistake of the theory or the religion that they follow. Now, Muslims have gone through their decadence. Crusaders went into the Middle East and killed 200,000 Muslims and Christians locally. Inquisition of Europe have killed 10 million Muslims and few thousand Jews. Nobody talks about those two big holocausts. When I was speaking to the LA County Commission on Human Resources, I said, we do not accuse them, we do not say anything. He said, no, you should accuse them. I said, no. Whatever they have done, they have done. And 10 million people were killed, worse than Spain, uh, what's going on in Bosnia now. Also, this, I mean, 10 million is not from me. It's, I, I can get you the books if you are interested. Colonialism went into, from Europe into Middle East and, Euro, uh, and uh, Africa. And we have seen exploitation. We have seen even before that the mass slavery that came to Europe and America and Latin America. I was in that country of Senegal and I went into the island of the slavery and I want every human being to go and see the island of slavery, how those millions of people came from Gore Island. And I went into the uh, cells and the uh, jail where they were chained down and they were beaten and they died. And luckily, or not luckily, whatever you want, fortunately or unfortunately, name it whatever you want, not a single Muslim Arab or non-Arab country was involved, and they have the list of all the countries were involved in slavery, who brought and hunted people like hunting uh, animals. And you can see all the inscriptions of political leaders in French, in English, and other languages about the destiny of those men and women who were chained down and brought, and how many millions died through the slavery. Forget about it. 
We have also the 18th century, 19th century colonialism, exploitation. We have Zionism in the Arab world of today. We have communism, we have nationalism in many parts of the world. Forget, let's stop on this point. You didn't come to listen to all this. You came to listen to something else, scientific reflections. Now, Quran is not a book of science, but it's a book of revelation. In Islam, there is no conflict between Quran and science. Quran has full information about universe, research, investigation, analysis, deduction. Islam acknowledges scientists and gives them high credit. And whoever is a scientist to do research, God loves you so much so because that is your role on this planet. Your role on this planet as a human being is not to sit and believe without questioning your faith and your scientific data that came to you. Don't take anything for granted. And don't misunderstand those who are professors here. Even a professor, when he gives you something, you should put a question mark. Of course, when I speak on food health and behavior, which is not part of my talk tonight, but I might reflect a few ideas on it, food health and behavior, I start uh, putting all the question mark about the water that you drink, whether it is hard water or soft water, whether you drink soft drinks or you drink coffee and tea and alcohol, and I go through detail how far it is good or bad, and I say to the good audience like you, if I can contribute to your brain today a big question mark what you drink and what you eat before you touch it, that is my gift for you. And I want you to do the same thing, not only of food and liquid, because it affects your personality character. Tell me what you eat, I tell you what you are. You are what you eat, because the chemistry of the food that you are eating affects the chemistry of your blood, affects the chemistry of your brain, and then accordingly, you behave rightly or wrongly. As you are aware, there are four major factors affecting your personality character. One of them is the gene of your parents, the psychosomatic, sometimes a little bit behavior. Number two is the food, whether you eat the right food or not from the moment you are born, whether your mother nursed you or she gave you the cow's milk and therefore she denied you her love and affection and the humane hormone and gave you the animal hormone and you are being devoid of that type of affection toward your mother when you grow up and you want to run away from your mother and father when you reach the age of 16 to 18 and you want to live on campuses rather than with mom and dad and you might do some of the, those boys and girls who strip all the money from mom and dad and they left them on, in the senior citizen's home well, one for one she denied you and you denied her. When you needed her, you, she didn't. When she needed you, you didn't. Number two, food. Number three is the society. Tell me with whom you associate yourself. If I find you daily in nightclubs and dancing party, of course I know what personality you are. If I see you with your professors in the lab, day and night, working day and night, I know that you are a man and a woman who deserve to be recognized as the future leader of mankind uh, in science, technology, in any other discipline rather than to be a wishy-washy person in the society. Now, God has, I'm not quoting Quran now, because of the audience are uh, a good number non-Muslims, I'm not going to quote the Quran verses like this, in as much as to mention that the first revelation came in Quran is about reading. Now, those who know Arabic, Iqra, is the first verse came to Prophet Muhammad is to go and read. He said, I don't know read. I didn't go to university, no teacher. He said, read in the name of your Lord, God, who created mankind from the uni unity, union of the fertilization of ova and sperm. And read in the name of your Lord, who has taught you the use of the pen. So reading, you need a pen and paper. You cannot sit and say, I listen. And I'm sure your professors do demand from you to do not only reading and writing and do homework and then do research and put it in writing. But all those reading and writing should be for the love of God and the sake of mankind. Atomic bomb, unfortunately, nuclear weapon, unfortunately, is being misused to kill people. We should have used the nuclear weapon for the sake of safety of mankind rather than killing human people. 
Now, before going into specific of those that I was planning to share with you, let me mention that even Christians and Jews in the days of the Muslims were uh, so happy in science and technology and investigation and Muslim gave them the best avenue. If you ask any Jew of today, which is the golden age in your history? Is it during the Roman Empire or the Crusaders or the Spaniard or what? They will tell you it was only and only during the Muslims in Spain when they have had all their research and their uh, promotion. Now the early scientists, which we don't have them today, used to be specializing in minimum five different specialties. Today you find a biochemist in the field of biochemistry and in lipids, not in protein or DNA, finito. No, those early scientists used to be specializing in several specialties. He may be a theologian, a mathematician, a physician, a physicist, a philosopher, and at the same time a historian. Now even you could read what Mr. Reagan, with his theory of uh, Reaganomics, when he gave it in the, after he was elected and coming with that philosophy, how we bring the inflation down by promoting more business, he was quoting somebody by the name of Ibn Khaldun in his speech on TV. Ibn Khaldun, he said an Arab by the name of Ibn Khaldun has spoken how to bring inflation down by promoting more business. Second day, some lobbyist in Washington, D.C., how could you dare to see an Arab, an Arab, an Arab? You are quoting you, Mr. Reagan, an Arab, quoting uh, somebody with your speech, so they try to harass him. You should not use an Arab or a Muslim in your speech because Muslims and Arabs are terrorists. They are not scientists. Now, let me share with you step by step and help me as a dialogue rather than uh, one-way traffic. We said in the introduction of the flyer that they have sent you, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Help me. Somebody says what? Egg. Somebody says the chicken and somebody says both at the same time. Let us use for a moment our scientific knowledge. If it is the... Can you see all of you? If it is the egg, you try to hatch it in a hatchet. I'm sure since you are on a campus which has uh, agriculture is a top priority for it. Can you hatch an egg? Maybe yes, maybe no. Hatch it. Put it for one million years, nothing will happen to an egg. Unless and until it is being fertilized. And those who sell eggs, they usually put them in the hatcher 24 hours. If and they see it through the electricity or the fluorescent light. If it is not fertilized, they sell it. If it is fertilized, they keep it to produce a chicken. So there is no, uh, nothing unless it is fertilized. If it is not fertilized, therefore no fertilization, an egg, the starting point, will end up into zero. How about the chicken? The chicken, when it grows up, it might be either a hen or a rooster. The rooster does not produce anything. Hen, of course, it produces eggs. But they are not fertilized, they end up into zero. If life has started with chicken or egg, nothing happened. Life could have been closed down millions of years ago. Even if you tell me both, well, at the beginning, so what? Nothing would have happened. So common sense should tell us, I mean, using common sense, should have what? What, egg and chicken? Ah, you should have rooster and hen. Huh? That is both. There should be a rooster and hen so as to have fertilization to take place in order when the hen produces eggs, they are fertilized and then you hatch them and then the life starts. Therefore, the starting point of life should be, should be. I'm not saying it has, I don't, I wasn't living one million years or 10 million years or 100 million years before, but the logic dictates upon me that if life had to start on this planet somehow, somewhere, it should have started from male and female. 
in order to produce. And this is what Islam says in the Quran that life has started on this planet with a male and female. Who are those male and female? The starting life of you and me, ancestor, God told us it was Adam and Eve. He didn't say it was the one cell microbe and that cell was microbe multiplied and then ended up into the ape, chimpanzee, and from that we came. If you want to believe that concept of evolution, it's your choice. Nobody can stop you from it. If you know your ancestors, that your ancestors are the ape and the chimpanzee, that's your own choice. I know my ancestors. My ancestors were Adam and Eve. Now, those in biology, and I have said it many times, why in the world Darwin and his group have used only going up the ladder in mutation and in development rather than up and down. Those who do genetic and heredity in selection of making a hybrid better than the previous generation, usually you end up with 25%, the best 50% it has dominancy recessiveness and 25% which is recessive and doomed to be thrown away anytime you do anything of this nature. And therefore you take from the 25% and then go up, up to improve the hybrid or the new generation. This which has dominancy and recessiveness, come see, come see, half and half, you don't work with it. Why in the world Darwin at that time, he said it, it went up and up and up and up till we came ourselves. Why not start also, life started from up and went down also. It was, all it was, 25% up, 25% down, and 50% in between. Now those who would like also to say, that even some human being were degraded to the level of chimpanzee. If not physically, biologically, it is mentally. And ape man, and even pork, have been degraded from human being. If it is not biologically, it is uh, morally, sexually, and he ended up into that. Well, we'll come to it later. But nevertheless, the starting point, therefore, now Noah, when Noah was asked to take his ark with his uh, two species of each, Many people, when I ask them, what did Noah take with him? A male and female, huh? of every species. And even Muslims who read the Quran may say the same thing, the Christian may say the same. I said, no, the Quran is very explicit. It is in two places in the Quran. He was demanded to take two species, two of every species, I mean two pairs of every species, two males and two females. Very simple. Quran is very explicit about it. He never said, Now he said, if you want those who are Muslims and they are fervent, they want to know in Surah Yehud and Surah Mu'minun chapters, قُلْ نَحْمِلْ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّنْ زَوْجَيْنِ اثْنَيْنِ And the other, فَسْلُكْ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّنْ زَوْجَيْنِ اثْنَيْنِ What is a pair in English? Help me, those who are Americans. A pair is a pair of shoes, huh? a pair of human beings, therefore two. And therefore two pairs of each. Two pairs of each, which means he demanded, God demanded from Noah to take two pairs of each species. Why? Very simple. So as not to allow inbreeding to take place. So no inbreeding but outbreeding. Why not to have inbreeding? You know it from your biology and uh, inbreeding brings decadence to the variety. Even they tell you never ever get your BA, MA, PhD from the same university. And even if you get your PhD from that university, you administrator don't allow that professor to teach in the same university where he graduated from. Otherwise, in reading of knowledge, then it will be decadence of knowledge. Therefore, if you take your PhD from this university, go to another university and you will find better rather than the same university. Inbreeding of ideas is decadence. Inbreeding of human beings biologically brings decadence. And we know inbreeding means incest. And those who came from North Africa, don't uh, worry if I said the pharaohs have practiced inbreeding. Where are the pharaohs of today? 
Of course, the Egyptians, they tell us about the history of pharaohs, but the pharaohs are no more pharaohs. They lost their hybrid because they practice inbreeding or incest. And the Quran is very explicit about the saying, no way that you can marry your relatives and has specified in chapter 4 women about those who are known no to marry them. You cannot marry your mother, your daughters, your sisters, your aunt of both from father and mother. You cannot marry the daughters of your brother and the daughters of your do uh, sisters and so on. It goes on and on. Even it goes more. You cannot marry a girl that was nursed with you from the same mother. Even if that mother, who is not your mother, a mother that your own mother, one day she could not nurse you, she gave you to another lady to nurse you. The daughters of that mother who nursed you, even you cannot marry them. And we know in biology and genetics, and we know in pathology even, that there are certain traits can be carried in the mother's milk as well as diseases sometimes. And therefore Islam said no in order to keep you being born as a human being with all the intellect, biologically and mentally. And even Islam has demanded from the Muslims, uh, try your best to go way far to marry somebody not from your own tribe, your family, and the more you go way far, the more brain intellect will be far better for you. It's now, we'll go to another, either simple or hard. Now, we know about sex determination. When I took the course on genetics when I was undergraduate student, some 40 years ago, now, sex determination. We knew at that time, even more than 50 years ago, genet uh, genetists and hereditary uh, professors were telling us that sex determination is determined. <coughs> now, those who want to know the word sex determination means the, the, the determination of the new fetus, whether it will be a boy or a girl. Who determines it? All what we now, of course, if the mother is expecting, she goes and make CAT scan and ultrasound, they will, and the palpation of the heart of the fetus, they can tell you in advance whether a boy or girl. But who can determine it? It is not being controlled by outside agent, it is controlled either by the ova or by the sperm. We have been told that since we have the 24 X chromosomes and 20, and then we have the X and the Y chromosome, and they are X and X only. And if and when from the sperms that fertilize the ova, XX, you'll end up both X's, and then you end up with a daughter. But if the X with the Y fertilizes, you'll end up with a boy. So the determining factor is the Y chromosome that came from the man, from the sperm, not from the ova. Now, when I wrote an article and small pamphlet in those years in the 50s about this idea, why I have to write something of that nature in the mother tongue of the old country, not here, in the Arabic language, because up till now you can see many times fathers want their wives to bring them a boy before they bring them a girl. Why? I don't know. The tennis may be a factor. They want to see a boy before they see a girl. Even up to now, you see people, I do family counseling, and I see that many parents, they want their wife to get them a boy, baby boy before a baby girl. I don't know why. It could be for economy, it could be for taking the name of the family again from generation to generation. I said, if it is true what you want, you want your wife to get you a baby boy, rather than a baby girl, why don't you give her the Y chromosomes from your two billion sperms in one ejaculation to select and fertilize only one ova. There is only one ova and you are giving two billion sperms in one ejaculation. Why don't you select that sperm which carries the Y chromosome to fertilize that particular ova? So it is your choice, not her choice. Why you are mad at her? Why you are cursing her and blaming her, you did not bring me a boy, you did not bring me a boy. So it's your own choice. So don't blame your wife, be gentle to your wife, be good to your wife, and live peacefully altogether. Of course, it is decided by God. God said in the Quran, it is being decided by him, whether it is this way or that way. But if you don't like it, 
go outside this planet and then live a different way of life. Now, and this particular discussion has been mentioned twice in the Quran, that it is the sperm that determines the sex that is to come. For those who are keen from the Muslims, it is written in Surah Al-Qiyamah as well as Surah Al-Najm, Surah Al-Najm 53 and Surah Al-Qiyamah 75 chapters. Now, we go to something easy and then related to our private and public life as a human being. Be whatever you want. I'm sure in your chemistry course and physics course you have a freshman at high school now. You talk about electrovalency. And you talk about covalency. For those who are in humanities, they don't mean anything. Now, what is, <laughs> what is electrovalency? Electricity? Possibly. Electrode? Possibly. And ions? The cations? Possibly. And what does this have to do with us as a human being? You know, electrovalency is that, I'll give you an example. Sodium, it's an, in its ionic form, anything as an ion, whether it is positive or negative, it can give electrons, it can take electrons, so sharing or giving and taking electrons from an element to another element is called electrovalency to make it a, 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 stable, a stable compound to make a stable society now my talk here is relating to a stable society if and when there is an element which is rich like sodium it's a rich element it's an ionic state I'm sure those who have taken a course in chemistry where do you see sodium metal being saved or put? Is it put on the shelf like this? Or put on a bottle of kerosene, tight properly, in order not to get out of the kerosene, not to get out of the bottle. If you get it out of the bottle and you leave it on the table, it reacts with the oxygen of the atmosphere and it gives explosion. And if you are afraid from its explosive approach, you put it in the sink and pour water, flash fire explosion at the sink, double. So we have to keep it there. And therefore, any society, let me now compare it, which is rich, cannot stay by itself rich. A rich society is an exclusive society. Until and unless the rich person gets out of his way, and look for a poor person to share his richness with the poor person. Sodium will continue to be explosive, will be detrimental to the society, to its own self even, and to the society around it. And it will be explosive to the whole neighborhood. And therefore, either we should control sodium ion under it, or find an avenue for the sodium to get out of that explosive state. Sodium looks for the poor element and say, is there any other element in my neighborhood who is poor that I can give him my one extra electron? By the way, it has only one extra electron in the outer shell and gives it out, it becomes positive. So it has to give its extra, extra electron from the outer shell. To who? To another element happen, one of them, just for the simplicity of it giving an example, Chlorine. Chlorine itself, ion, is negative, has seven electrons in the outer shell, but it is not satisfied. It's also damaging to the society. Why? If you see chlorine is a gas, can you smell chlorine gas? Pungent. You start coughing, and it's, it, it uh, destroys the epithelial tissues of your uh, nose and lungs because it's toxic also. So chlorine itself, by itself, poor is bad to the society. A rich person in the society and a bad per a rich person and a poor person in the society is a curse and a crisis. The rich has to go to the poor and say, are you in need of my help to give you the dollar? I have one dollar extra. I don't need it. It is too much explosive in my pocket. If I keep my money in my pocket, there will be a pickpocketing. Don't we have pickpocketing 
in big cities, go to Chicago and LA, Detroit, and even in department stores during Christmas, they tell you, beware of the big property. And therefore you find, therefore, the same thing what happened here, that the rich element has to go with the poor element and join together their society. What will happen? We'll end up with sodium chloride. What is sodium chloride? Table salt? Is it explosive? No. You use it, you enjoy it. Which means that even capitalism as such without, which means richness, which means money talks, and only those who have the money can control the destiny of the White House and the uh, stock and bonds and the whole thing. Therefore, the rich people have to give the poor people something out of their pocket with generosity, not with bragging and exploitation, to live peacefully together and free. Now, students who, if they don't receive any scholarship, you get crazy. You start yelling at the university, at the Department of Education, and everybody, I need money, I want to study. Somebody has billions and billions of dollars, and you don't have even a thousand dollars. And instead of eating a regular meal, you eat daily what? Hamburger, and Coke, and potato chips, or French fries. It's enough. One dollar, two dollars, and too much for me to spend it. Therefore, while well, somebody is spending fifty dollars on a meal, and we cannot spend even two dollars on the meal. And somebody has billions of dollars, and he doesn't know what to do with it. He put it in stocks and bonds and lose most of it. And you need only a few hundred dollars to go for your education. Income. Therefore, the rich people have to look for the poor people. Islam has demanded that the rich people have to pay their zakat 2.5% in order to take care of the poor needy society. In the days of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the Umayyad uh, Caliph, the collection of the zakat was to be given to all the needy poor people after they distributed it all the way from the east to the west, from Morocco to Indonesia, they couldn't find any more needy people. He told them, go and spend it on the non-Muslims. They want and spend it on non-Muslim needy people. They said, we have still plenty of money. What to do with it from the zakat? He said, go and spend it on those young men who want to marry and have the mahar dawari as well as the reception, walima. So they spend it. They spend it even on the highway or streets to improve it and to make uh, toilets on the highway and uh, spring of water on the highway. So the donations is a must. And it is not as a generosity and bragging about it. It's the right of the poor on the rich. Now, how about if both of us are poor, what to do? Shall we go and steal or we go and then share our poverty together and live people? We go back to covalency. When the two are poor, have to work together and share their poverty and improve their poverty into happiness. Chlorine ion, we'll go with chlorine ion to end up with chlorine molecule. Chlorine molecule is no more toxic, it's no more gas, it's no more pungent to your epithelial tissue. Chlorine water is being, used, is being used as antiseptic to the water so as to clean it from all types of bacteria and germs. We go to another simple one before we go to the difficult ones. Because your background are different from each other, somebody may be interested in higher science, others general. We have been told that x over 0 reach infinity. If we reverse it, x over infinity reaches 0. What does this mean? From a life. I want everybody to reflect from your deduct also, reflect, deduct from anything you read in science and technology for the sake of humanity so as humanity will live peacefully. x is a definite number. It could be anything. One, two, three, it could be years, it could be millions of years, still it is definite. Infinite, no number, reaches you. Live as long as you want on this planet. Your life on this planet, comparing it to the life in paradise or hell, is reaching zero. How many years do you wish to live on this planet? Million, there is no numbers, it's infinite. So the Number of years of life on this planet, comparing to the number of years of life in the hereafter, reaches zero. Huh. Some more reflections. You live a happy life here, you have all the happiness of this life. Anything and everything you ask, it came to you on this life. The happiness of this life, comparing to the happiness in paradise, 
is nothing there. How about you are being tortured, persecuted, you tell it's, really, it's a hell of life here, anything and everything I do, and it is negative, and everybody looks down upon me, and anything I look at it is gloomy and dull, with all the punishment, even if you go to jail and you have been punished in jail and whatnot, the punishment and the hell of this life comparing the real, real hell in the hereafter is nothing. So, try to reflect on it and then try to see. That is if you believe in the Day of Judgment. But if you don't, I can help you to believe in it. Yeah, from your biology and science and whatnot. Now, many times we talk about uh, a plant. And the plant usually rebuilds itself, resynthesizes itself protect itself for new generation like you and me. But uh, how the plant does it? By having a fruit. Inside the fruit there are the seeds. Within the seed there is the embryo. The embryo goes through dormancy and it needs time, heat, temperature, humidity, water, put it in a medium where it can rejuvenate itself and resynthesize itself. A huge oak tree is saving itself in a small seed and the embryo is so minute. So how about you and me, when we die, we want to preserve ourselves to be resynthesized in the Day of Judgment. How we resynthesize ourselves in the Day of Judgment? In the Day of Judgment, uh, you are to save yourself in your embryo, in your fruit. Do you have a fruit of yourself? Each human being has a fruit of yourself. And the fruit of yourself is having the seed in itself, and the seed in itself has its own embryo, and the embryo has its DNA, RNA, and the genes to save you to be resynthesized from the grave when the time arrives. Where is it? Where it is written? In, in Islam, it is written that there is something in you which is called the fruit. That fruit is the sacrum. And I'm sure you know the sacrum. Osmos. Those who know Arabic, Osmos. The lower part of your body which is five bones. That five bone is considered in the teaching of Islam is the fruit of you, identity for the day of judgment. And the fruit has its own seed, and the seed in the, the lowest part. It's a small cartridge line called Uj. It's an Arabic word Uj, or Ajr, or whatever you call it called Ujj al usmus the Ujj of the sacrum, that is your fruit. Within this seed, there is the embryo. In that embryo, there is the genes that are being carried on it. In the Day of Judgment, it is mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith that it needs an angel whose name is Israfil, who will blow the trumpet the first time and the second time, and water from heaven. It's not H2O, it's some other combination of uh, chemical compound which will be poured on the grave of everyone and then water reaches that particular seed and this seed will come and then rejuvenate and we will come from the soil like a seedling. For those who know Arabic, it is Wazirat al-Ard, Wazirat al-Ard, Wazirat al and therefore you come out from the soil after it has been shaken and we will come back at the age of 18 to 25 to assume our responsibility for the Day of Judgment. Now, we go a step further. Now, if you want to know more in detail about it, I have a book which I don't know where I put my books. Thank you. Now, this book which is called The Life, Death and the Life After from a scientific point of view and a religious point of view. And I have uh, diagrams of the detail of all these things using my diagram of biological sciences and about the idea of the scientific research and investigation that the early Muslims have done in uh, Spain and the Middle East. There is a book called Islamic Fundamentalism, which we are going on this nowadays in America. Next two days, I'm supposed to be in Syracuse university there to speak on this subject and to live peacefully together as Muslims and non-Muslims. So this is Muslims and non-Muslims face to face. We live together, we study together, we go to the same department store and grocery store, we eat similar foods. 
but seemingly we don't talk to each other to understand each other to live peacefully. So we face each other face to face and we want to live peacefully. For sex determination, there is another book which I tried to publish before and I could not because of its sensitivity among the Muslims. Muslims, morally, they are too conservative, if I may use, too reserved. One time I was giving a talk to the parents and their youth in Chicago, and I was telling them that Mrs. Reagan have said no to drugs. We say to you no to drugs, no to alcohol, and no to sex. S-E-X, on sex. Some parents jump on my neck. How could you dare to use in front of us the word S-E-X? Don't you know it's a wrong terminology in front of us? <laughs> you see, she is nodding her head. Very good, I'm glad to see that, yes. Yeah, you, don't, you cannot use the word S-E-X in front of us. That is haram. Haram is illegal. It's unlawful to pronounce it on your mouth in front of us. Taboo. I said, I'm sorry. And I was planning to publish the book uh, under the title of Sex Education in Islam to tell them which is right, which is wrong. I could not. So I put it in my files for two years. All of a sudden, still people telling me we should have something, a book like that. So I changed the title from sex education into matrimonial education. Matrimonial education. Matrimonial education means husband and wife sex. There is no sex pre-marriage. They look at me. When I speak to Americans and uh, non-Muslims, they look at me, what crazy man you are telling us no sex before marriage? How do you want us to enjoy that? I said, go and marry. No, no, no. I said, marriage is the same as other, but it has legality, it has responsibility, no responsibility. They want to live uh, common law, no responsibility. I said, no, Islam says responsibility. You want to enjoy, enjoy it, but enjoy it even with legality. What is lawful even of sex between husband and wife, religiously and medically, and questions, I have so many questions in it and being answered even medically and religiously, what is lawful even between husband and wife? And in order not to get venereal diseases and not to get any uh, other type of diseases. And now, those parents who said no are teaching it for their children. And they said, now why don't you write us another book, which is called the pre-marriage education. Pre-marital. So I have already finished half of it, pre-marital education in Islam. Sex education, I cannot use the word sex. So you have to help me, and you have, we have to be smart enough. Language is a language, you know? And we want to be specific and to the point, and not to hurt the feeling of those who are to feel here. Now, the other thing. <coughs> there is something which I should share it with you. Something called prostration. What is prostration? Called sujood. When Moses went to the mountain to pick up the Ten Commandments and he requested God, please God, show me your identity, whatever you are. He said, you cannot see me. He said, please God, let me see you. He said, you cannot. Okay, go up to the mountain. When I exalt myself to the mountain, you may be able to see me. When God exalted himself, the whole mountain cracked into pieces and he fell down on his forehead, prostrating to Almighty God, saying, I'm sorry. And he was baffled and unconscious. Jesus also prostrated to Almighty God. Mary did the same thing. Muhammad did yeah. the same thing. Muslims nowadays do prostrate. So what? What's the big deal about it? Scientifically, what not? I have written a small book called Prostration and Sujood from a medical point of view, from the engineering point of view. I'm sure a good number of engineers may help us tonight in appreciating and understanding. Now, it was mentioned uh, by a large number of engineers that we are receiving every day electrostatic charges from the atmosphere. And we are concentrating it and we are putting it in our central nervous system. Our central nervous system mainly is the brain. And then it comes from the brain into the whole body, which is the nerves themselves. And the communication goes back and forth through the chemical compound called acetyl-CoA between neuron and neuron to give the messages and then back the messages. Now, therefore, the brain is the central CNS. Luckily, 
the brain of a human being is different than the brain of the animal. The difference between both of them is the front row. Those who studied medicine and human anatomy, they can appreciate it better in the sense that the difference between us as a human being, our brain from the, human, from the animal brain, is the front row. For this reason, you have read so many articles about lobotomy and psychosurgery. If those don't know much about lobotomy and psychosurgery, you go to the uh, Department of Justice and enter a good number of prisons and jails and you see what happened in the jail. Some of the prisoners have been inflicted upon them this idea of lobotomy by the Department of Justice, whereby they have to get an electric drill and destroy part of their front row. Why? Because they are dissident, unhappy, talkative activists. They want to cool them down. How to cool them down? By destroying their brain, the front row, and then they stay as a human being, but they behave like animals. Stand up, stand up. Sit down, sit down. Go, go, come, come. Sleep, sleep, like an animal. So they lose the concept of humanity as a human being because the brain, the human brain with intellect, that you listen, you understand, you manipulate, you manage, you execute, all are found in the front row. The rest of them is mechanical for the sake of movement of your body. So now, when you receive the electrostatic charges of, you, of the atmosphere, whether music, whether noises, whether anything, comes to your brain and it concentrates in your brain. And mainly, you end up with depression. And depression is on your front row. And mainly also your depression here on campuses, when I go to campuses, I say, uh, give me the chance uh, of the doubt when I use it rightly and strongly to the professors. Most of your professors also push you too much. And every professor thinks that his course is the only course you are taking and you are taking nothing but his course. He gives you homework every week, quizzes, drop quizzes, drop quizzes, just to surprise you, surprise, they call them surprise quizzes as if he is fit for tired to check upon you when you did not study last night to catch you this morning and then to put you in trouble. Like the police, he stands at the corner hiding himself under a tree and then when you are driving a little bit five, ten miles extra, catch you. He's no more the police to save your neck, he's the police to check upon you. When in the world you make a silly mistake, catch you. So you are under your pressure nerves. And the teachers are giving exams and giving this. If you don't attend you call my course and don't submit, I will not give you an A. And some professors, I still remember, we were taking a course, entomology. And one of the professors, because he graduated from Germany, and you know, German, they don't give good grades. He said, anyone who wants an A, you know, by the way, graduate courses, if you take a C, means you are flunk. If you take a B, you are on the borderline. You should have A's in every course. If you take a B, your advisor say, what did you do wrong? You didn't make an A. B means you are on the borderline. That professor who graduated from Germany, he said, whoever is looking for A, you are looking to, take, to kick me out of my professorial ship and you want to take my place here. He said, I will never give an A to anybody. You will be lucky if you get a B and C. <coughs> he is the lord of his course. He does not care what the university policy says, and therefore he put all of us under the pressure. So we are receiving pressure every day. What should we do when we are receiving pressure every day? Either we go on alcohol to socialize, sex to socialize, or drug for tranquilization to reduce our pain and penalty, and we come back after 15 minutes or one hour in the same dilemma and the same pressure. We did not release ourselves from the problem. The best way to get it out of your brain, out of your body, without using any drugs, without any side reaction, without anything, is to do what scientists have taught us. Now, electrical appliances, electrical appliances, most of them do have three probes. What for? I asked them. They said one is for positive, one for negative, and the third one for grounding. Grounding what? electrostatic charges. Otherwise, if they do not ground the electrostatic charges, anytime you touch an electrical appliance, it shocks you, it shock you. And you know, during the humidity and rain, you are walking on a rug and then you catch even the knob of the 
of the odor, you find electric shock. You even catch your car, electric shock. And we are shocking each other every day. Professors, students, student to student, man to man, man to woman. We are shocking each other every day. And the only way, thank you. So, the only way, therefore, we have to do what the engineers have told us. The engineers have told us that all those extra, extra electrostatic charges that we are receiving on our brain, we should get rid of them. How? Tranquilizer, no. Drugs, no. Sex, no. Alcohol, no. So why? What should we do? You say, why don't you do the same thing? You ground yourself like the electrical appliances, grounding itself, grounding itself. How to ground myself? My brain and your brain is here. It's not in our feet. We walk on the ground. We are walking, doesn't matter. And then we have insulators. Our shoes, if they are rubber, they are insulated. So you have to do what Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Mary have done. And what everybody should do is to ground yourself. And take a course, what is called, not yoga. When I was teaching in a medical school, one of my students, an American, he was flipping upside down on the tip of his head and putting his leg up in the air and catching the air as much as possible. I said, after he finished, why? He said, that is yoga, to get peace of mind. He didn't get peace of mind because his brain which is the front lobe as a human being, not the mechanical. He's, putting, he's grounding his upper brain, which is the mechanical brain, grounding it to the ground to get rid of the electrostatic charges. It doesn't work. Therefore, yoga did not work. Millions of Americans have spent and work up to now on TV and courses and you pay money to go and learn yoga in order to have peace of mind. They could not. Some of them went to India and they practiced yoga and somebody got his PhD in TN, Transcendental Meditation in the University of Southern California, the physiology of TN, nothing it didn't work because it's not. The brain, the real brain of yours is here. And the only way to get rid of the electrostatic charges from this front law is to ground your front law on the ground to get the electrostatic charges. I talk five minutes with a rabbi, a friend of mine who is working with us uh, on the food, kosher and halal food. And when I talk to him about Moses and about electrostatic charges and you should ground yourself and come up, he struck his mind and he said, let me try it. He went to his uh, room in the hotel and came back second day. He said, look here, Ahmed, I, last night I made you prostration like what is written in your book, what Moses has done and others have done. Uh, let me tell you honestly, I got rid of my sinus. He had a sinus, and then he got it out. He said, I will practice now this idea for a new course, which is free of charge, by going and putting my forehead on the, on the ground in order to get rid of the electrostatic charges. I went to a private school, Christian schools, because one Muslim girl is studying there, and then uh, the principal and the teacher asked me to come there. Among other things, coincident, I was speaking about the prayer of a Muslim and that Muslims do prostrate to the ground as a sign of obedience to God, as a sign of also uh, what I'm saying now. The principal, she is a lady Christian, and the teacher is a lady Christian. They got amused with it. They want to tell their students to practice prostration. They could not. They said they will accuse us as if it's a religious, it's a Christian. So they told all the boys and girls, when you go home, go and prostrate and put your forehead on the ground as a physical entity and come the second day and see what you have felt. And both of them told me we are going from now on practice this idea of sujood down and to see the benefit of sujood. Of course, it has more medical. Those who have uh, dizziness and migraine in their head, instead of having regularly vacuum and other tranquilizers, Try that approach and then see if that prostrating down to the floor and put your forehead, nose, hands, knees, and toes all touching the floor as extra terminal, uh, like if they say in computers, extra terminal, then you can get rid of most of the electrostatic <coughs> charges from your central nervous system and hopefully that you can live peacefully and well within yourself as a human being because I want every human being to live peacefully within yourself and with the society. Otherwise, if I'm not living peacefully within myself, if I'm not living peacefully with myself, 
I can aggravate all of you. It's easy to aggravate anybody. And I'm sure most of you are being aggravated here and there, from TV to teachers to friends to anywhere. So why don't we try something but it has to have conductor, huh, to conduct electrostatic charges. Unfortunately, Muslim play on a rug. You should play directly on the soil in order to have conduction. Now I have uh, about uh, still uh, two dozen uh, items to discuss with you uh, about uh, creatures of uh, creatures outside this planet on other planets. We have also about Day of Judgment, about your fingerprints, how they can come back to your DNA and whatnot. About the fetus being protected into three layers. About your uh, development as embryology. One professor by the name of Professor Keith Moore at the University of Toronto Medical School, he has written a book, Human Development. And his textbook was the, uh, I mean, the parent or father or mother of all textbooks in the human development. Every, uh, most of the medical schools teach their students that textbook. Coincidentally, he was attending a physis physician <coughs> medical group from Muslims in America who went to Jeddah to attend a medical conference. And he was surprised and shocked to see that some of those medical doctors, Muslims, were speaking about the embryology and development of the fetus in the mother's womb. Uh, minute by minute, day by day, and all these things from chapter to chapter, and he could not believe unless he saw it. When he saw it, he was re he re he, re he rewrote his book with uh, somebody from Yemen, uh, Sheikh Zendani. They rewrote a book, their textbook. Every chapter, the first part is from Quran and the Hadith. The second part is the medical approach. Step by step, picture by picture, slide by slide, outstanding textbook that all those who are interested in science of embryology, I do encourage you that you read. Now, as far as the pork and alcohol, I wish I had time to talk on uh, pork and alcohol. Now, we do know that pork is no no in the Torah. And I was surprised when I was young, I was told that the Christians are allowed to eat pork, but the Jews, no. When I grew up, I found that the Bible itself, the present Bible, says no, no to pork. Christian says, are you sure? I said, yes. I was surprised even when I was young, I was told that the Christians are okay for them to drink alcohol. When I was giving a lecture about alcohol from a biochemical point of view to one of the community colleges in Chicago, one professor wrote me the verse in the Bible said, no, no for alcohol. So if and when we read the Bible properly, we will find that the Bible says no, no for pork, no, no for alcohol. When God has prescribed something good, it is good for everybody. Whether you are Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Baha'i, whatever you are, even if you are atheist, the good is good universally, the bad is bad universally. I have written uh, several uh, booklets on alcohol as well as on pork. The pork I have written about the medical aspect, the nutritional aspect, the microbiological aspect, the social aspect, the religious aspect, and how far it is dangerous for your health. The least of all, if anybody asks you why, of course, we do it because God said. That's the simple answer. If you want to reflect more, the simplest of all, if somebody asks you why don't you eat pork, you should ask the question, why don't you eat the meat of a rat? That? you know what is a rat? Why don't you eat the meat of a dog? Dog in America? Come on. How about a cat, a mouse? Everybody says no. I say, why? All of these are animals. You tell me they are protein, they have protein. Why not to eat the meat of a human being? Human being? What's wrong? Meat, meat. All of them, he said, no. So, all of these animals that I mentioned, including us, are carnivorous animals. Human beings are not supposed to eat the meat of the carnivorous animal. That's the simplest answer. We have hundreds of reasons to say no. And I have enough reason to share with you. I still remember in the island of Mauritius, in the Indian Ocean, was I, I was invited to speak at the university, even the president of the university was there. I wasn't talk about, uh, talking about pork, 
But Christians of that country and the professors of that time, they said, why you Muslims don't eat pork? So I said, since you asked that question, let me answer you in five minutes rather than detail. In five minutes, I summarize some of the highlights of the damaging effect of pork on your personality character, on your social behavior, on your also medical aspect, even the president of that university. That booklet that I have written about pork, even now medical doctors, nurses, and others stop eating pork. I have, I, I forgot to bring it with me. It's a small booklet, about 75 pages, and I have written from, as I said, different aspects. The same thing about alcohol. Even the Bible says no for alcohol. Alcohol is not meant for the decent people who would like to reflect their wisdom. Now about fasting. There are many varieties. I have written also a book on fasting, booklet on fasting, from a medical aspect and nutritional aspect and religious aspect. And uh, one professor has written dozens of articles on the biochemistry of fasting. Professor uh, Mouf, Mouf, Mouf. Uh, uh, his main writings are in the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. After he has written so many articles on biochemistry of fasting, he came to the conclusion. He said, whatever you say about fasting, fasting is meant for self-denial, self-obedience, self-discipline, self-control, to teach you how to be a better citizen. Dr. Alan Cott, medical doctor, in his book about diet and the fastest way to dieting, he said about 28 items why people do fast, among which is religious and spiritual. To the Muslims, of course, is a sign of obedience to their God, and this is one of the five pillars of Islam. But it has many, many things benefit. You can detoxify your poisons from your body through your liver. Your liver is being overloaded daily by too many pesticides, too many preservatives in the food. And even if you tell me I'm eating only the natural foods, the organic food, which has no pesticide, no preservative, nothing, the protein itself that you eat has byproducts. The main byproducts of protein is the amine. Amine is urea and ammonium hydroxide. Urine mainly is urea and ammonium hydroxide. Therefore, it's toxic. Even uh, carbohydrate, if you keep carbohydrate in your body, whether the starches or the sugar, the byproduct of carbohydrate, glucose. If you keep glucose in your body, it's toxic, you have diabetes. So you have to get rid of all of these. How can you get rid of all these poisons in your body when you are eating day and night, drinking day and night, right and wrong? He said, give chance for your body to detoxify the excessive amount of poisons. And most of the wise people in the history of mankind, I'm saying wise people, Christians, Jews, Muslims, everybody, had to sub subjugate themselves a uh, minimum of 40 days of total fasting in order to bring their wisdom to us. So if you wish to remember your homework and your exam to come to the final exam properly, try not to be baffled and be fucked with too much tranquilizers, drugs, and alcohol and whatnot. Fast a little bit here and there, and then you detoxify yourself and your brain can function far better than otherwise. And my, I know the time is running very fast. I still have this book of manual.